Thank you very much. And after this uh, fantastic talk about citizen science in the humanities, I'm really pleased to, uh, to follow and thank you for the invitation to present on citizens uh, create knowledge, knowledge creates citizens. Um, as we said, uh, we face a global phenomenon, but we also face global problems. Coming from my disciplines, we have nine uh, million species disappearing at an alarming rate, and no policy has so far um, halted it, and no evidence from science so far. So we have missed policy goals. On the other hand, oops. <coughs> On the other hand, we have about seven billion. Um, <coughs> people with their own agendas as well and there are millennium goals which we haven't managed to to fulfill either and there are uh, there is scientific evidence but so far we haven't reached that goal and i think um, we can't not just simply generate and communicate scientific knowledge that is not su uh, sufficient to combat neither biodiversity loss or other um, urgent issues and knowledge of traditional and ordinary science uh, citizens are possibilities for innovation. And um, as uh, I, I just talked to um, Jean-Claude Bergermann uh, doing, uh, doing coffee, and it's also a missed opportunity. We have uh, how many scientists are around and how many people are around. And there's so much expertise, and it would be a shame to lose this. And also, apart from that, it's anyway, it's happening already. We've just heard about some fantastic um, projects in the humanities, in environmental research, uh, I think, or in ecosystem research, this has been um, very common that most of our data sets on species um, are actually generated by volunteers. So there was a recent um, a study on European uh, monitoring schemes and 95% um, of the data are actually uh, um, contributed by volunteers. And for example, recent Nature Climate Change paper on um, on climate, uh, climate shifts um, and responses of species, it was um, uh, calculated that 1.2 million volunteer hours went into this. So this is actually a phenomenon which is not new, but which has um, it's also leading, um, so alloc um, linking to the Oxford Dictionary, I think it's an old tradition, and I think we've uh, maybe forgotten about this. But also in new techniques like um, biomedicine, for example, the folded game um, originated in the US um, is using online gaming compu uh, computer facilities in order to, um, uh, to develop new algorithms for protein folding. And for example, there, have been, um, there has been a call for the um, Ebola proteins, but also for AIDS. On the other hand, something very far removed, like galaxies, image classification is being used in order to classify galaxies, and uh, new galaxies have been found. So already um, thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, volunteers are already engaging in this, and I think uh, what we need to do is to embrace this and to build the structures to, or to build the infrastructure and to, the capacities to, to develop this further. So, obviously, um, and I think this is how my previous speaker already said, citizen science has, um, has really originated in the Anglo-Saxon world, and there have been some uh, landmark publications, um, for example, from the UK, the US, or there is the Atlas of Living Australia, um, and uh, societies have, uh, have been formed in these countries. And also the EU commissioned a report two years ago about the, um, an in-depth report on the environmental um, citizen sciences, but it's not only in the environmental sciences where uh, citizen science plays a role. Um, in, the, in Europe, we had the development of a green paper, which has now been gone through a consultation and been published as a white paper um, by uh, Spanish colleagues from the Societies team. And we know all that um, co-design and co-production is crucial in all the um, sustainability research council schemes uh, or research schemes across the EU with Future Earth and Horizon 2020. At a European scale, we have um, established the European Citizen Science Association, of which I'm a board member. And in Germany, we have established the Bürgerschaften Wissen platform of this, um, uh, um, Citizens create, uh, creates knowledge, creates science, um, of, of which Mr. Tochtermann is also in the advisory council. So, but what is the motivation here? So the goal, uh, it was, um, EXA was announced um, at the Green Week in uh, 2013, and the goal is to motivate five million citizens within the next five years to participate, so this is the goal. But I think the EU Commission really sees it as a highly, um, sees it as a political goal, that it's a highly valuable opportunity um, for offering enhanced levels of participation in assessing and determining the success of, for example, EU environmental politics. And when our centre, the German Environmental, uh, the Integrative 
Center of um, Biodiversity Research was open, the former environment minister said to us, and don't forget the people to involve them in biodiversity research, even if it's um, very fundamental, uh, basic, and not necessarily applied research. <clears throat> and we also have a call from the German government where it's written in the coalition contract that we want to involve citizens and stakeholders from civil to society consistently in the discussion about future projects, it says only discussion, and the design of research agendas. Um, I would go further to also involve them actively in research. We want to develop new forms of citizen participation and the communication of science and merge them into an overall concept. So, what are the goals of citizen science? These, is, these are just some draft goals. So, first of all, to the active participation of citizens in scientific processes coming from data acquisition to processing to true co-design and co-production of research. Then the policy goal of really increasing scientific literacy and empowerment of citizens by increasing understanding, acceptance, uptake and implementation of research which needs to be transparent and responsive in society. And then from a research point of view, so it's sometimes seen um, probably as a burden and I, um, um, I added a slide after the talk from um, from um, Kopp-Rogerman, I think the innovation potential is not yet realized. It is happening, and by engaging a variety of knowledge domains and inducing also new perspectives, we can actually reach innovation and um, form new partnerships. So, I think uh, citizen science isn't just one blob, but I think there are different levels of participation from passive observation and communication of research needs, which is very often seen as the main domain of citizen science. But I think we can go for, oh, there are, and I think this has been mentioned just now by the previous speaker, there is also active participation to co-production or um, projects where actually citizens come up with the questions and the design and then ask, look for partners in uh, established science, um, science systems or do it themselves. And I think we have to actually move across this whole claviature and use um, and enrich this uh, potential. So the motivation really for citizen science comes from uh, um, three angles. So it's a scientific knowledge uh, generation definitely but it mingles uh, the engagement factor is both the personal interest and the societal relevance. And I think here we have to move and there are different forms of citizen science. In order to um, give you some data of that there is actually potential and there is a willingness to participate, there was a, um, uh, a survey in, uh, in Germany in t uh, 2014 where they asked uh, 1,000 people and they said, would you be in general interested in participating in scientific research? And over half of them actually said yes, they would be tentatively interested, and um, a third were definitely interested. Um, then when we asked them as a team, uh, well, what kind of, where in the stage of research um, process would you be interested in? It's interesting, people are interested in actually asking the questions, not so much in designing the research. Uh, data collection is something which maybe comes to mind. Um, also analysis, documentation, but also publication and communication. And they can, con um, and here I think we have to see how citizens can be involved in the whole of the research process. But now following the first talk, I think there was this hesitance uh, in the Science 2.0 uh, or Open Science consultation that um, researchers were maybe a bit hesitant and that's why I included just this slide this morning, that's why I haven't um, translated it. And uh, at the Our Hamos uh, annual um, event or annual <coughs> conference, um, there was a um, um, poll, a TED poll, and where we, uh, they, uh, people were asked, so many researchers then or scientists, um, how they, uh, what their position was on citizen science. And I was actually quite pleased with this result. So a third actually said it's, it's high time that the civil society gets engaged or, uh, in science more. I think this is a good result. Then um, there was the second one is, yes, there should be more participation, but there should be um, limits. A third one was a bit more skeptical. We see potential, but we have um, doubts about data quality. And there we're holding a, a conference or a um, workshop um, next month, uh, also here in Hamburg, with, um, with Professor Tochtermann and uh, the team uh, from Kiel here. And uh, so only very few said, and maybe that, that was obviously biased, uh, but it was an um, anonymous um, survey. They said, well, actually, amateurs don't have anything to say in, in science. But I, I, would say, um, I would say these are non-institutional scientists who may want to get, get engaged. 
also in Germany, um, but also worldwide, there is a, a lot of um, interest in the press, and we have got a lot of press coverage where there are also doubts whether citizen science could be misused as cheap. And I think we already said that um, it's not necessarily a cheap uh, opportunity, but also that um, citizens might be um, misused as just uh, cheap labor and um, not in incorporating the whole capacities. So, and this is um, where we come in with our Gewiss project, Bürgerschaften Wissen, and this is the German Citizen Science Capacity Building Program, where we are trying to, uh, where we're establishing a citizen science platform with networking opportunities, the dialogue forum and advisory board. We are um, looking at, uh, we try to evaluate the, um, at least the German scientific scene uh, on citizen science with opportunities, challenges, capacity and demand and develop um, practical citizen science resources, for example, a guide, um, film, as well as web portal. And most importantly, at the moment, we are developing the, um, co-developing the citizen science strategy 2020 for Germany, for, uh, to which I'll come later. Uh, we are a consortium of uh, the Leibniz and the Helmholtz Institutes, together with um, university partners and funded by the Research Ministry of Germany. And uh, we had a kickoff last summer um, with a big think tank in Berlin, followed by um, several dialogue forums which are ongoing over this year, and you can inform yourself over the, um, at our website, and reports are all downloadable, but they are in German because they are meant for a German public, um, especially, uh, especially because we're working with German citizens. We are obliged to publish them in German, but there will be English publications as well. Um, you can also go onto our website, where uh, which is, um, managed by the Museum for Natural History and uh, the Wissenschaft im Dialog, where citizen science projects are listed and people can um, actively participate, but also where our resources are um, and all uh, documentation of the uh, fora are um, listed. And uh, through these fora, we, will, we want to work with citizen science projects and with actors from science, practice and policy to look at how uh, citizen um, projects are actually devised going from an idea and development phase, which is often forgotten, a start and initiation phase, which can be lengthy, a project and learning phase, and an evaluation and benefits phase. And uh, most importantly, we're at the moment uh, um, having um, drafted a citizen science strategy 2020 uh, for Germany based on contributions from more than 200 people who are, uh, uh, joined our, um, our meetings. Um, from uh, over 80 uh, organizations. And um, out of the think tank came four visions, which um, I would like to relate to you. So in 2020, citizen science is an integral part of German society with active co-design and co-production of research in science and society that is valued, rewarded, and living or alive. Citizen science is a recognized, supported, and regular practice approach to research. It brings innovation potential by integrating diverse knowledge pools and extensive or intensive involvement for the collection and analysis of large data scales, um, sets in space and time. It is a widely used approach in all areas of science, which also includes disadvantaged and marginalized groups in society in research processes and is well communicated to the public and is funded based on newly developed evaluation criteria. Um, it is a reliable science approach with web-based infrastructures that support both quantitative and qualitative citizen science projects as a trusted and pr um, privacy compliant environment and is a motivation to participate uh, for, uh, for two million people in Germany in research projects. I think a lot of these goals have already mentioned in the, have been mentioned in the open science uh, consultation. And therefore I would like to go into some of these more um, targets which the citizen science strategy goes into. Um, so we analyze opportunities and demands. I will skip over this. But I think what we need to do, or what we think what we need to do, is we have to develop uh, capacities in both science, society, education, media, and structural capacities. And um, in this forum, I will focus on the science capacities. And these have been all, these have been developed by um, contribution of more than 200 um, participants. So if I go through these, uh, these are obviously only draft. These will go through a consultation this summer. So what we see is that we need a shift in science culture for citizen science. 
And first of all, we lack academic excellence criteria, and this links to some of the uh, the, the talks this morning. That actually, people um, you, you can't. Va it's it's very difficult to value citizen science, and it can be actually devalued because it's um, it doesn't have any reward system. Um, this comes to uh, award mechanisms and career options, which are um, often lacking and which can be negative actually for scientists to engage. It also lacks guidance and training, but. Um, more fundamentally, I think the funding system at the moment, in, um, not in only in Germany, but um, internationally, I think, lacks the uh, flexibility for co-design and co-production. So really, in normal um, research uh, projects, it's actually not possible to do proper citizen science at the moment. And so we are working with the funding bodies and the research councils to, to look into this. And we'll have a, a workshop later on in June uh, in Berlin for this. Then, I think this was mentioned by the Open Science um, consultation as well, we need a strong data infrastructure. And this workshop was actually led by um, Professor Tochtermann, and where we need quality standards for data management, simple protocols for the collection, semi-automated quality assurance protocols and repositories, or, which could be larger research institutions, libraries or networks. And then, obviously, uh, in citizen science, we also need to develop quick feedback mechanisms uh, to involve citizen si uh, citizens. They can't wait for the ISI publication to come out, which is obviously not, ex which may not be accessible to them. So there, there must be other ways. And for example, a dot on Google Maps or other. Um, I think that there have been several mechanisms um, explored already. Um, I think a common theme already was uh, this morning that we need a technical infrastructure as well to accommodate science to our open science, so establish infrastructures, advisory services and arrangements for citizen science. Um, we also need to see that citizen science 2.0 is part of the scientific evaluation system for researchers and research institutions, as Mary is the first part, and there um, we actually embrace the um, potential for innovation and creativity. Then also, I think our Minister for Research and, um, and Education, she said, there's also innovation potential in technical advances of new instruments and new centers. Um, she said this in an interview just recently. And so, for example, we can develop new sensors that are easy to use. Um, the uh, era of online av availability that you've got your sensor in your pocket with your smartphone, apps for data acquisition and dispatching, they are rapidly developing, but, um, and we should use, uh, make increased use of, or it is already being used, um, new media, social media, and so on. But here, it also needs appropriate funding mechanisms to support this. And finally, I think we shouldn't forget, there are also legal issues and um, intellectual property uh, issues, and this is what the workshop is going to be on um, in April, in, uh, in early May in Hamburg, uh, where we have to look in copyright um, aspects in terms of data collection and dissemination. Um, portals, metadata, ba um, basic accessibility of data, but also privacy um, aspects of, if, for example, if you log on your data and people know where, you, where you're surveying, this may be, um, this, this is not a non-trivial um, aspect. And for example, uh, Citizen Science Project also said they need some kind of insurance, for example, if data, if accidents happen during data collection. But we don't only need capaci uh, capacities in um, science, but more so, also in society. So we need evaluation for good uh, volunteering management in citizen science. And here we can learn from volunteering management from other, other sectors. So there are quality management guidelines and we have to adapt those. And there needs to be also a culture of appreciation of volunteers and that they're not just willing workers, but that we communicate at an eye level and uh, that there is a recognition of citizen scientists and they may actually gain also recognition in their, um, their other professions for this. We need to strengthen existing structures, for example, NGOs, learned societies or um, acad um, academies as coordinators to facilitate network and training. And we need to provide, um, promote motivation and all kinds of all forms of participation. So moving from low entry barriers so that you just have to, for example, use your iPhone in order to um, photograph the night sky in order to assess light pollution, to involvement of the expertise which is out there and which could be, out, which could be much greater than anyone working at, in academia at the moment for a specific field in data anal analysis and communication. And here we just have to, um, for example, that's only an example, taken into account age and social structures as well as time allocation, which may be different to scientists which work in a, um, 
professionally in, in a science job. Thirdly, we also have to uh, develop capacities in education and media and embrace this. So, how do we actually in, uh, include citizen science approaches in uh, education? I think uh, Jeffrey mentioned already, we should also embrace them that in higher education and integrate this in um, university teaching. But uh, we should explore uh, wider possibilities um, as well as limitations, uh, explore the role of museums, archives and libraries, um, as well as some scientist formats. And here we should, um, for example, also integrate um, extracurricular learning um, sites and methods in curricula of schools, for example, and embrace the notion of learning by doing, that there is a deep understanding not only of scientific process, but for example, of environmental processes or social processes, for example, through citizen science projects. And we can use media actually to communicate with citizen science or actually to develop citizen science projects. And I think we are, we've been approached by several media um, science journalists who are um, covering the system at the moment and they said, well, we play an, uh, a crucial role, not just at the end, but for example, through, um, throughout the system, uh, throughout the process of citizen science projects. And last but not least, I think we do need structural capacities and we can't just, um, it's a bit difficult to slot them into one of those, um, those pool, uh, either science or society. So I think we do need development of training and education uh, tools, guidance, and for example, train the trainer workshops. Um, we need financing um, and development of new funding structures really for citizen science. Um, that for example includes also remuneration of volunteer researchers. Um, I think one idea is for example to establish these people who can stand in both worlds. So who could be scientific, uh, citizen science coordinators either in scientific institutions or in, um, uh, in NGOs. We should research Funding should also uh, look into funding scoping phases to initiate and co-design new collaborative projects, which is often done sort of, um, which there is often not enough time for. Um, for citizen science, I think the longevity also needs to be uh, taken in, uh, into account and there should be some long-term funding for, for example, existing citizen science projects. But citizen science projects also said to us they need some subsidies, uh, subsidy funds for really small projects like 5,000 euros for a room. This is usually not attainable to them and they, um, bureaucracy would be too high to, to apply for this, but this is often what it needs in order to, to get bottom-up research done. Or for a car hire, something like this. And then I think uh, we are already engaging with the European Citizen Science Association in networking uh, of citizen science activities and with our GWIS program um, across Germany. And uh, so we need platforms for linking existing science, uh, citizen science projects in exchange of expertise. For example, through websites or dialogue forums. Um, and this should be complemented by public events, competition, and uh, there is the plan to have an international um, citizen science conference in Berlin in 2016. And uh, we hope we can send out the invitation. It's, it's still in the planning. So, but who is the one to implement it? It's not only science. So science, obviously universities and research needs, uh, institutes need to play their roles. But also, I think here we have to just from the start work in partnership and work in partnership with societies, for example, with NGOs and learned society academias, uh, ac um, ac academies, um, also existing uh, citizen science projects as well as non-organized citizens. Uh, we have to work with educational um, institutions um, and uh, also higher education, obviously, um, but also use those uh, extracurricular um, education institutions like museums, botanical gardens, zoos, or archives. And crucially, I think uh, there needs to be, or we are engaging in dialogues, or the research councils are actually coming to us and funding bodies to look for solutions how this could be empowered. Um, but of course they need the evidence that uh, citizen science creates an um, added value. And here I think we're, uh, we're talking to research councils, trusts, business, um, but also national governments and obviously uh, DG Research and Environment is, is helping here as well. So the Citizen Science uh, Strategy 2020 for Germany will go into a public consultation in 2015. And we hope that we can launch this. Um, uh, we are at the moment in the development phase with the advisory body, as well as with uh, citizen science projects. 
And uh, this will be an online consultation. There will be the opportunity to send consolidated position papers. And they will be also discussed in, uh, in the different workshops we have, um, thematic workshops. And the launch is planned for um, 2016. Thank you, and I hope you can contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. Are there questions? Yes, I see two. First one, second one. Thank you very much for a very informative and intensive presentation. You've given us a fairly detailed look at the various measures that are needed to get the project off the ground. Um, let me be the devil's advocate for a moment and ask you, you know, let me tell you that I'm still trying to understand the basic rationale behind the whole thing. Um, is this some kind of an educational initiative for the people as a whole? Are we trying to get people away from trashy TV programs and let them do something meaningful? Why would they be interested? I mean, the public at large. Is this a response to the fact that the idea of a publicly funded university is, is dying? Do we have to find alternatives um, for you know, making or for, for creating science? Uh, and finally, what is the relationship between existing universities, if they continue to exist in their present form, to this form of citizen science? Okay. Um, <clears throat> actually, we came from a, a science um, a perspective only, and education was brought to us afterwards. And I think um, it, to take a normative approach to this would be, um, I don't know, it's, it's a waste of time. I think what... Um, uh, or it's not a waste of time. I think there, there is an educational aspect to it, but this shouldn't be the first aspect. This should be an, um, um, a byproduct. But I think there is the uh, knowledge and expertise which is in society which can be um, embraced and harnessed to, uh, to lead to innovation potential in, uh, in, in science. I think there is a partnership. And I think this is already happening, so I think we don't need to necessarily, uh, necessarily foster it, but we do need to foster the, um, the networking between the established science and the volunteer science. So um, I don't know whether this answers the question. Uh, I think universities still have to go a long way because some of them are actually not aware of the um, potential that is out there. So for example, let me know. Um, so there are actually too few at the moment evaluations of the scientific potential of citizen science. But one, for example, is the folded game where they looked at the generation of an algorithm through online gamers who didn't know anything about molecular biology. And they came up with a better algorithm within three months than was published before. And at the same time, a team of scientists in London came up with a similar good, not the same, algorithm for protein folding. And so I think there is just potential out there which could be um, yeah, embraced. <clears throat> yes, thank you. Um, I'm Lambert from Hanover, and I wonder, um, from my point of view, there is one hugely successful popular platform for citizen science that has grown without any kind of state funding, organically bottom-up, that is about building a structured, proven body of knowledge with many campaigns for data collection from citizens and the huge international audience, and we all know what I speak about, of course, and that is Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. And I was really wondering a bit about the lack of any kind of mentioning that, and c could it be that this is just something that, that happened in the, uh, to, to be mentioned in the um, Twitter conversation about your talk, that the lack of government funding, and that this is not the kind of organization that is government funding, leads to that, that you don't uh, go into this platform and try to learn and cooperate with them. That no. would be uh, sad. But it's, it's just a, a, a question. Uh, well, I actually had uh, Wikipedia and Wikimedia actually on my. I wanted to um, oh, sorry. Uh, actually present this, but we, because we had the humanities beforehand, I concentrated on the, uh, more on natural sciences. But uh, apologies for this. Um, I think uh, we we uh, we are in touch with Wikimedia, uh, which is the organization between. Uh, um, and but what you, I think one point you raise is whether, or I, what I hear is whether funding 
might actually be counterproductive. And there are lots of initiatives which are risen out of the uh, out of com communal spirits or out of energy, which is uh, not dependent on funding. And whether um, do I get this right? So I think uh, I think we here we have to. Um, if we work with citizen science, we have to uh, realize this potential and not and st strengthen it in some ways and not smother it t through, for example, funding, although I talked about funding. So I think this is a, um, a balance, but for example, the UCL, uh, UCL project of um, transcribing Brentham, obviously, if you have to provide the infrastructures behind it, often you do need funding for that. Or for example, if you do a coordination of volunt volunteers and volunteer management, that, that is often done through structures. So, but I, I, I do take your point that sometimes, or often, or many of the citizen science projects have started without any funding, and they will continue to do so. Thank you. Yeah. I think we have a very last question, short, question, short answer. Yes, thank you for your um, talk. And um, I go back to the first um, question again. I'm a sociologist. and. Yeah, I was not sure what kind of expertise um, is actually needed from um, the citizens um, in contrast to the professional scientists um, because I um, recognize that there are a lot of premises in your um, goal. Um, it's about um, the innovation potential that is not yet realized, um, but what is exactly um, the empirical um, basis of your um, talk? So I think it's a question, um, what exactly goes beyond um, the projects you mentioned? There's always the best practice um, project folded in um, the center, um, the wisdom of the crowds, mm -hmm. but um, we know that there are um, professional scientist um, with a specific kind of knowledge and with a specific kind of expertise and uh, of course you know um, Harry Collins um, with his different kinds of expertise. I would need a more um, empirical data um, on how to realize um, such big uh, movement we are talking about here. Okay, this is, this is why, why it's called capacity building program, because I think the empirical data are to an extent missing. There are s other uh, examples. For example, I think uh, from my profession at least, I know that taxonomic expertise is actually dispersed through society and not necessary in academia. So for some very uh, specialized groups, uh, also we know from museums that they have experts in society which, who they work with, and that could be, for example, experts in ancient bone flutes, um, and that expertise might not be at the, uh, at the university. Or, for example, if we see that there are experts in ancient Greek and Latin around who can actually um, help in translating this. So I think that is true, but I think you are right. And this is what we're working for. We have to build up the evidence base um, to actually see what the added benefit of citizen science contribution is. And it's not, and I would like to say, it's not um, a surrogate. It's complementary. Uh, it should be complementary. There will be overlaps, but I think it is uh, it is additional. Thank you.